It's like going through an attic full of memories, only these are the recollections of an entire county. Here the artifacts and old photos not only remind visitors of what past generations cherished, but they also show how they lived and how the county grew. Hello, I'm Jim Wilhelm. Today we're visiting the Jersey County Historical Society in Jerseyville. It's a complex of three buildings, the most notable of which is the mansion, which has grown up around the town's origin. At first, the home was not as grand as it appears today. This wing and the tower were added in the late 1860s, but the center portion had been built around and incorporated parts of an existing structure known as the Red House. This is one of the front rooms of the old Red House. It was built in 1827, and of course its appearance back then would have been a lot more rustic. The floors would not have been finished, the walls would not have been plastered. But the Red House was the first framed home in town. Eventually it was bought by Alfred Carpenter, who operated a stagecoach stop and tavern inside the home. It also became a meeting location. In 1834, several men from this area met in this room. They felt that the population of this area warranted the creation of a new county. They also thought that this town, which was known then as Hickory Grove, needed a new name. Several names were voiced, of course, but most of the people in this room were from the Garden State. So in 1839, Jersey County and its seat was located in this newly named town of Jerseyville. Later, this property was bought by Edward Darcy, whose father had served in the Revolutionary War as a surgeon to General Washington. He too was a physician and one of the wealthiest men in town. Darcy remodeled the old home, and in the 1850s he added this wing in order to continue his practice. He even added a separate outside entrance so his patients wouldn't have to enter through the main house. Inside is a safe bearing the name Cheney, that was the name of the man one of Darcy's daughters married. During the Civil War, when battles were being fought not too far away, there was a run on the local banks, so they started their own. As we've learned, this home played an important part in this county's history. But it's also thought that it was involved in a national controversy, the movement toward freedom. It was discovered that of the two cisterns dug for the Red House, only one was used to collect rainwater. In the basement, visitors can enter into the false cistern, which is believed to have been used to shelter escaping slaves heading north. At one time, there was a tunnel which ran from here to the other side of the street where a livery stable and blacksmith shop once stood. Above was a trap door that opened to the rear of the old Red House, away from the street. Of course, documents were not kept, so no one is sure how many people stopped here on their way north. After playing an important part in this county's early history, the home is now used today to present other aspects of local history. For example, hanging upstairs is a sampler which has a connection with one of America's most famous Western artists. This was done in 1843 by Cornelia Russell, who was the aunt of famed Western artist Charles Russell. On display is a letter he wrote to her with its own original sketch at the top. Charles, like Frederick Remington, is known for depicting the vanishing West. And speaking of paintings, here in the formal parlor is one of some flowers and some vases. It's not very exciting, but it does have an interesting past. It was appropriated by a local man who was serving with the Allied headquarters at the end of World War II. We're told he was among the first troops to enter Adolf Hitler's headquarters, and using a knife cut this painting out of its frame as a souvenir. There's also a set of gerbid medals on display that he collected while overseas. Also in the parlor is this knobby piano player. The controls and music rolls were hidden away in a drawer under the keyboard. At the time, knobby pianos had the reputation of being a singer's piano because of their mellower tones. This is a genealogical research room, which is located in a building which has several other rooms displaying more of the society's collection. Here's a set of pictures and a diary kept by Robert Newton. He and his father joined in the gold rush to Cripple Creek, Colorado. One excerpt reads, 
We expect to return toward the river next week. Hope we have in our claim the banks. Report from Denver City, they're hanging horse thieves. Two or three have been hung, and two or three more are expecting the same fate. This room looks back on the gadgets used on coal or wood-burning stoves back in the days before electricity. For example, this item was placed on top of the stove, which allowed the heat to come up the center, toasting slices of bread. Here's a waffle maker that rotates so the batter could be heated evenly on both sides. In addition to their use for cooking, these stoves were used to warm the irons, some of which would weigh as much as 10 pounds. Nicknamed sad irons from an English term salad, which really means solid, they were usually sold in pairs. That way, while one of them was in use, the other could be warming on the stove. But you had to be very careful not to scorch the clothing. This is a fluting iron used to make ruffles, and this thin iron was especially designed to work on and in sleeves. And here's one that came a little later. It was heated by gas and attached by a rubber hose to a gas pipe. And speaking of clothing, the museum has on display vintage clothes, including wedding dresses, for the periods between the 1800s and 1930s. And then there's the military room, with items from the Civil War to Desert Storm. From that era is a selection of Confederate money. Plus, here are discharge papers from 1864. Over here is a breakfast K-ration from World War II. That included canned meat, biscuits, cereal bar, coffee, sugar, toilet paper, gum, and cigarettes. Behind me is one of the last surviving one-room schoolhouses of this county. Inside, children were seated in rows according to their year of school, the youngest usually in the first row in front of the teacher. Lunches were brought in pails or buckets. There were no backpacks back then, but leather straps were used to carry books. There were 77 county schools located in Jersey County. We're told that the rule of thumb was to locate them so that no child had to walk more than a mile or so to school. Students ranged from grades one through eight. During those early days, teachers were not only expected to instruct children of various ages on a wide range of subjects, but also to teach them manners and morals. A coal or wood burning stove provided the heat a bucket with a shared dipper with a drinking fountain. And in the back of the room, there were separate coat rooms for boys and girls, but no bathroom. Instead, there were a couple of outhouses. Today, the research center and museum complex provide a glimpse into this county's history. Here are the mementos saved by generations so that others may be reminded of the past. And just across the street is the location of the town's first cemetery the resting place of many of this area's pioneers. For more information about the Jersey County Historical Society or about any of the buildings we toured, call 618-498-3514 or log on to www.jerseyusa.net.